This one will have audio, which is good. And we're into some interesting territory. The alveolar ventilation perfusion ratio. What could I possibly mean by the alveolar ventilation perfusion ratio? Let's unpack that idea. Ventilation perfusion ratio. So we're matching two things, ventilation and perfusion. And how those match is described by the ratio. What are the things that we are matching? Or not that we are matching, but the body matches. Or what are the things that we need to assess to understand function of the lungs locally? Ventilation and perfusion. So ventilation is very similar to the concept we just discussed, the movement of air, but specific to the alveoli. The alveolar ventilation perfusion ratio describes how well the air arriving at the alveoli matches the blood arriving at the alveoli. Think about that. There are over 32,000 alveoli in the body, and I'll probably stop using that number because I'm sure it's much higher than that. Each one of them, to achieve gas exchange, needs a supply of new oxygen or new air and a supply of blood, deoxygenated blood that needs to be oxygenated. Now, depending on where you are within the lung, these values might vary. Air might reach some areas and not others. Blood might be directed to some areas and not others. And the ventilation perfusion ratio describes how well those two factors line up. For a given region, for a given alveolus, does it get enough air to satisfy the amount of blood that it sees? And ideally, what we would like is for those two things to be equal, relatively equal. We want there to be enough blood so that the incoming air can fully saturate the deoxygenated blood. We don't want there to be too much blood. That way we can't achieve our goal of diffusing oxygen. We don't want there to be too little blood because that wastes some of that fresh supply of air that we have on hand. We would like these two factors to match. Notice I'm not saying we want them to be X amount. They could both be high or both be low, but the idea is we want them to match. The idea is the ratio should be close to one. What does this look like in practice? And I'm simplifying this drastically before we discuss it in more detail on Thursday. What is the ventilation perfusion ratio? So in these examples, let's take a look at this scenario, which is, Sorry. no problem, the alveoli in the middle, the blue thing, and then the capillary supplying that alveoli is the yellow squiggle. And I do that because blood's not red. Blood is largely plasma colored, and the thing that makes it red are the red blood cells, the red blood cell you can see over here on the left. So the capillary around the alveoli and one alveolus in the middle, the alveolus getting a fresh supply of oxygen. You can see the molecule of oxygen waiting at the top. So in an ideal situation, we have red blood cells moving through the capillaries. With that movement, we have oxygen coming into the alveoli and to achieve the goal of gas exchange, for the lungs to do their job properly, we want those two to be in the same place at the same time. We want them to match. Um, if you think in terms of amounts, that's fine. One liter of blood, not one red blood cell, but one liter of blood can hold about 200 mils of oxygen. And conveniently, a liter of air contains about 200 mils of oxygen. So thinking in terms of singular red blood cells and singular oxygen 
atoms is one way to think about it, or you can think in terms of volume. If we can match a liter of blood with a liter of air, we'll also achieve the matching we're looking for, that desired ratio. So ideally, we want about a ratio of one. The air in the alveoli matches the amount of, uh, of blood seen by that alveolus as well. Notice, um, because I forgot on the last slide, ventilation is written slightly differently here. We normally uh, see it as VE, expired ventilation rate, the amount of air that uh, is moved into and out of the body. But we measure it with a metabolic cart as it's being breathed out. So we think of it as the expiratory ventilation. This has a subscript A, and it's a capital A, which is reserved for the alveolus. Alveolar ventilation is what we're talking about specifically here. How much air is seen by this structure? How much arrives at the alveolus? That's what this number represents, or sorry, this letter, uh, this expression represents. Importantly, it's a capital A if this were a subscript or a lowercase a, that's reserved for arterial. Same thing with, with uh, B on uh, the venous side, B is reserved for the venous. The capital A is reserved for the alveolar um, situation. So we want these two things to match up. We have oxygen in the alveoli, we have uh, red blood cells arriving, hopefully in equal volumes and or matching numbers of, uh, of molecules. Oxygen binds to a red blood cell. Technically, four of them bind to a red blood cell. You remember that from AMP, and then they move through the bloodstream. This is what we would describe as ideal matching in a simplistic sense. We have one oxygen molecule being uh, moved into the blood and leaving with one red blood cell. The ratio between those two things is simply um, how do those measurements compare? And here, it's one to one, or a ratio of one. There's no waste in this scenario. We haven't diverted too much blood um, for the air that's being seen. We haven't opened up the airways too much for the blood in the capillaries. This is the ideal scenario. What happens in a non-ideal scenario? There are two less than ideal scenarios. This describes a situation with perfusion, but little ventilation. Lots of blood, but less air. And areas in the lungs that exhibit these characteristics are called shunted. There's more blood than air that can load them with oxygen. And so in this situation, we have red blood cells moving through, and maybe they're moving too quickly, so that the oxygen can't immediately move out of the alveoli, and we have some surplus of blood. In this simplistic example, we've had two red blood cells move out for one oxygen, and the ratio is not a number, but we're going to say it's less than one. A ventilation perfusion ratio less than one means there's more blood than we need, and that area is called shunted. Blood has been shunted for one reason or another to an area that doesn't need it. We'll talk about what effects that has. But generally, you can see this is wasteful. Generally, let me ask you, the PO2 of the blood leaving this situation would be what? And let's say higher or lower than normal. Not a number. The PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood leaving this combination of structures would be higher or lower than normal. I hear rumblings. Lower. Yes, absolutely. There's more blood than oxygen it's essentially diluted. Some red blood cells aren't binding to oxygen. PO2 in that sample is less than it should be. 
So if the body's goal is to fully oxygenate blood and deliver that blood to the periphery, scenarios like this don't accomplish that. We want to avoid these scenarios if at all possible. The opposite is also true. This is the, the second less than ideal scenario where there's too much air for the blood that is being supplied. And areas in the lungs where this is experienced are called uh, dead space. The areas in the lungs where there's too much air are dead space. Areas with ventilation but less than ideal perfusion are termed dead space. This doesn't tend to happen as much in the body. This is theoretical. It might happen in some extreme cases, but it's, it's not observed as often. Still, in this example, we have a large influx of air, specifically oxygen, for a smaller or slower supply of blood. We have, ultimately, a number of oxygen molecules for a smaller number of red blood cells. The ratio between those is higher than 1. Now, in these cases that I've shown you, they are points on a spectrum. Ideal is somewhere in the middle, and these two things are on either end. Physiologically, you're not ever at one of the three points. You move towards one or the other. You hover around the ideal area. Some regions of the lungs might go towards one side while the others go to the other. This highlights the scenarios that can occur. The question we'll ask next on Thursday's class is, does this occur? Does it occur in the whole lung? Or are there different regions where we can expect different ventilation perfusion ratios? And what does that mean? How does that impact oxygen delivery? Let me just say, though, that overall, if you summarize the lung to one point, combine all the alveoli, all the ventilation rates, all the perfusion rates, we end up with a ratio just above 1, maybe 1.1. So we're pretty good on average, which means that the ventilation perfusion ratio is on average not limiting. On average, there's enough air for the blood seen by the lungs to fully oxygenate uh, the blood, and then distribute it to the rest of the body. So as far as limitations to oxygen delivery go, these first three items are not a concern. They are not limiting. The next item, HbO2 affinity, I don't have many slides for it because it's like the uh, solubility constant. This is a characteristic of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has an affinity for oxygen. And that changes as oxygen binds. You remember the sigmoidal curve for hemoglobin, oxygen, association, dissociation? I didn't want to sh uh, throw that up because we can get into a lot of discussion about it. But generally, that curve has one shape. It can move a little bit with different temperatures. It can move a bit with different acidity. It can move a bit in the presence of carbon monoxide, for instance. But that shape, the affinity, is generally fixed. It's the same for all hemoglobins in the body. And maybe I should bring it back because it's probably worth exploring. But um, the affinity is such that if oxygen is present, hemoglobin will bind it. And that's a characteristic of hemoglobin that doesn't really change um, within, some small, um, within a small window. And so I'm not going to address it in detail here. It's not limiting to oxygen delivery in a normal, healthy adult under normal circumstances. That's all I want to say about that.
might bring it back when we talk about regulation because there might be some space there to squeeze it in. But let's call it there for class for today. Remember, your introductory lab is this week. Jody will meet with you in 120. She'll go over her expectations for the lab, talk about the assignments and uh, how to write a lab report, the general flow of labs. There's nothing to do this week. Everyone is coming at once on Thursday, 2.15 both A and B groups, which I realize I haven't separated out now, so that's good. Everyone show up at 2.15. Next week is our first uh, actual lab where we do spirometry, and you will be separated into A and B groups at 2.15 and 3.45. That will be posted on Moodle for you. I'll make sure to remind you when that's done. So this week, everyone in 2.15, you know the lab, the Exercise Science Center 120, where your ex-phys labs were, introductory lab, that's it. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you Thursday morning.